I'm so pleased that we get to be together uh, online today. And uh, I really do feel like we're together, even though we're scattered around different uh, living rooms and family rooms and dining rooms. I'm just so glad we get to have a uh, shared experience of uh, walking through today's conversation. Now, uh, we were in a series, and it was called, uh, uh, you know, uh, When Religion uh, Gets in the Way of God, Missing the Point. And uh, because of what we're going through right now as a, a country and in our region, we're just going to postpone that series, and we're going to spend uh, the next three weekends just kind of uh, tailoring and crafting material that can encourage us and lift us and give us a greater level of hope where we are right now. And then these three weekends will take us into uh, Easter, Easter weekend. And so uh, there is an expression that I have used throughout the years to talk about transitional space that we don't care to be in, uh, undesired space. And uh, the expression I've used is this. Uh, I've, called it, uh, I've called it the land between. It's an undesired space, an undesired space where uh, working parents are scrambling to try to come up with child care solutions for their kids as uh, schools close. An uh, uh, undesired space. Those of you watching today who are going like, Jeff, man, if this goes on and on and on, man, I I don't know how we're going to make it financially. Uh, The the land between undesired space for those of us who feel kind of cooped up and like everything is on lockdown. Now, uh, I use the term the land between as the title for my first book. I've thought about this space a lot, and I've preached on it from time to time, because I believe that this undesired space, the land between, is simultaneously the space that we most resent, and it is also that space where our gracious God does some of his very best work, his finest work, is often done in the land between. And so uh, installment one of this uh, three-part series, we're just calling uh, Thriving, Thriving in a Season of Uncertainty. Thriving in a Season of Uncertainty. And this, um, the nucleus of this message, it came to me while I was running. Uh, I remember that it was winter. I remember that it was cold. I remember that there was snow on the ground. And I was running in the snow, and I was depressing out. Uh, I I was involved in a, 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 happened to be a leadership challenge. It's just very, very confusing, complex, draining, disappointing, and discouraging. It was one of those things maybe you've been in where it's not only the emails are flying back and forth, but then people start commenting on each other's emails, and then people start commenting on the comments, and it was just this dizzying maze of conversation between those who were pulled into this drama and those who were attempting to find some solutions to it, and one thing was clear, this wasn't going to go away anytime soon. Now, honestly, I don't remember whether I was like trying to pray while I was on this run, but I can tell you that God met me on this short jog through a neighborhood near my home. As I was running, a thought popped into my mind, and the thought was this, Jeff, this won't last This uh, drama, this swirling email thing, one way or another, this is going to go away over time. It's, it's, It's not permanent. This won't last. And then a second thought popped into my mind, and the second thought was, uh, Jeff, uh, this is not unusual. I mean, anyone involved in leadership, whether it's running a multinational corporation or just trying to lead a family, will hit a leadership crisis from time to time. Jeff, this is normal. It's, It's common. It's not unusual. And then as I continued my run in the snow through this tree-lined neighborhood, 
Another thought, a third thought popped into my mind, and it was just this. I mean, come on, Jeff. It's not like anyone's rounding up your children and grandchildren and busing them to a concentration camp. I mean, this, is, this feels huge, and it feels hard, and it feels discouraging. But when compared to the truly tragic and horrific things in our world, this is kind of light. I mean, this is a, neither the Cambodian Holocaust or the Rwandan genocide. What you're dealing with feels huge today. But in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's, it's kind of light. And so by the time I circled back into my driveway, I, I kind of just kind of condensed this in my heart. And I just went, okay, it's light and it's common, and it's temporary. It's light, it's common, and it's temporary. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, dude, you need to turn that into a sermon someday. (laughs) Well, (laughs) today's the day. And what I want to do is to just acknowledge right out of the gate that the little drama, the leadership challenge I was involved in, it was nothing compared to the COVID virus and what we're all experiencing now. But, but, but I believe, I believe that the principles still apply. And so I really want to take a few minutes to walk you through each of those words that I just mentioned. And I also want to let you know at the beginning of our talk that, that these ideas are embedded in the scripture. Uh, in, in fact, uh, the, the apostle Paul, at one point in his ministry, he, he wrote this. He said, um, he said, our our, our light and momentary troubles. Now, I said, you know, light, common, and temporary. He got two out of the three here, uh, light and momentary. And in a bit, in a bit, we're going to talk about uh, what he was experiencing, why he wrote that, and what he was thinking when in his life he talked about problems, troubles that are light and momentary. What we're talking about here is, is, is perspective. What we're talking about here is uh, focus. When I finished my run and ran into my driveway, none of the issue was resolved. I was going to walk into my door and have to take another run at that maze of emails. But what had changed was my focus, and I'm telling you, it was mood altering. Now, before we jump into those three words, uh, just a word of caution. I don't think it serves us well to sugarcoat suffering. I don't think we're served well by sugarcoating grief and by sugarcoating deep disappointment. And so in walking us through these three words, I I don't want to sugarcoat sadness. But I think sometimes it's helpful to see sadness for what it is and to see grief for what it is and to see disappointment for what it is without letting it grow into something far larger than what it is. What I want to do in this conversation is be able to get a new focus and perspective that allows us to take a look at sadness and disappointment without allowing it to become runaway fear or runaway anxiety because we know something. We know that fear of tomorrow will rob you of joy today. And so let's talk about what's going on. Let's talk about these words. And in the process, let's attempt to realign our focus and our perspective. So uh, there were uh, three words that came to me while I was on my, my run as I ran into my driveway. And one of those words was just the word, just the word light, in the grand scheme of things, uh, when compared to horrific tragedy, what I was experiencing was light. Now, I, I know that even now, even now, some of you are going like, Jeff, you have no clue what we're going through. You have no clue the heaviness that we're carrying. You have no clue what's unraveling in my life. Listen, all I would ask at this point is this. Um, stick with me for a couple moments. Bear with me for a bit. And by the time we walk through these, it's possible that we will circle back to what I would call deep pain and tragedy. So please bear with me for a little bit. Uh, Some of you will recognize immediately the era of American history that this picture grapples with. This is a a picture of what's called the Dust Bowl. It was uh, in the 1930s. It affected uh, parts of Oklahoma, Arkansas, 
uh, parts of Texas uh, and, and some other states. And it was basically that the topsoil began to blow away, and it, it, it decimated farmlands in Oklahoma and some of the states around uh, Oklahoma. And, and by the way, the Dust Bowl occurred during the Great Depression. And so there was already massive hardship, and then there's massive hardship on top of massive hardship. And so there's uh, images like this at surface of families that are moving. Uh, here's a, a family. They've got all of their personal belongings strapped to the outside of their automobile, pulled, uh, you know, push, pulled, pushed the kids into the car, and they're about ready to make the trip, probably down Route 66 to go west to California, where they will find uh, something, maybe some work, maybe some people, maybe, maybe a new home and maybe a new opportunity. But it's a family that's, that's on on the move. Now, now, whenever I see a picture like this, it always causes me to pause because this Dust Bowl thing and this migration to California is part of my extended family history. Well, sort of. My grandfather is my dad's dad, and all of his brothers, his parents, they were farm workers in Oklahoma. During the Dust Bowl, all of their opportunities evaporated, and the entire family went on Route 66 to California, Bakersfield area, in order to attempt to find agricultural jobs in California. The entire family moved from Oklahoma to California, except for my grandfather and his wife, and they might have had a child or two at the time. Instead, my grandfather heard that there were factory jobs in Detroit, and he the well, entire family went west, my grandfather went north, and this is why my, my dad, this is why my dad was raised in the Detroit area growing up and not raised near Bakersfield, California growing up. And so I see these pictures of Dust Bowl families traveling, and it just kind of touches something in me where I kind of go, man, it hits awfully close. <laughs> Those are my people, you know. And so listen, just whatever you're experiencing this week, and it might be extreme and it might be not so extreme, as we talk about something being light, there's just three words I want you to whisper, if you would. And the three words I want you to whisper are these. Are you ready? Just whisper kind of like, oh, this ain't that. Just whisper those words out loud. This ain't that. In the frustration and upheaval of this coming week, I would doubt that there would be many of you who would be lacing all of your belongings to the exterior of a car and driving to a place that you've never been before in the hopes of finding something, in the hopes of finding everything. All I'm saying here is this. There's upheaval, and then there's upheaval. And just the ability from time to time just to go, okay, it's uncomfortable, it's confusing, it's draining, it's disorienting, but this, what are the three words? This ain't that. Now, I think you have the point right now, but I'm just gonna give you just one more image because I really want this particular point about our troubles being light. I just really want this to sink in. So uh, my wife, Chris, uh, most of her family lives in Sacramento, uh, California, Northern California. And so every, every year or two, we end up heading out to California, usually there's some ministry speaking involved, but also just for that wonderful opportunity to hang out with her family. Now, Sacramento, every once in a while, you'll hear about the, you know, the, California, the California wildfires that hit towns. And one of those wildfires, they called it the, the, the campfire, It'd be because it uh, broke out at a place, I think it was called Camp Creek, it just decimated sections of Northern California. But about uh, 90 miles north of Sacramento, about 90 miles from where Chris's family lives, there was a town called Paradise, California. And this is a picture of Paradise, California. It basically, the campfire of November... Uh, 2018, a year and a half ago, took out, virtually took out an entire town. Now, I want you to just wait what you're experiencing this week because I just know that so many of you guys, you guys are just going like, you don't understand, we're cooped up in this house and my kids are bouncing off the walls of our house and I want to go bouncing off the walls of your what? Uh, of our house. Like, 
Okay, there's upheaval, and then there's upheaval, and there's just the ability sometimes, what are our three words we want to whisper? Ready, ready? This, this ain't that. And my guess is that most of you slept in a bed last night, and you slept in an apartment, or slept in a house, or slept in the house of a relative. And even if you're going, yeah, dude, but I, I don't know that we're going to have this house or apartment three months from now. Well, you had it last night, and if you have it next week, just go, listen, this is upheaval and it's uncomfortable. But just be able to say, in the grand scheme of things, with the horrific tragedy that happens around the world, just to be able to go, this, this ain't that. It's one of the words that occurred to me while on my run. It's just, Jeff, this is disorienting and training, but guess what? It is light when measured against massive tragedy. That's word number one. Word number two is just, this is, this is common. This is common. <laughs> I was developing this material this week. I just imagined someone going, common? You gotta be kidding me. Uh, the COVID virus is like, it's, it's like one of a kind. This is, this is unprecedented. And it is. But the emotions that swirl around it are not that unusual. That is, it's it's unusual that schools would be closed, that restaurants would be closed, that everything would be on lockdown. What's not unusual, what's common, is that people would experience worry about financial strain. Uh, What is common is that people would have health issues and worry about those health issues. What is common is that people would go, you know, if this this goes on and on, I just don't know how we're going to make it a couple months from now. And so now, we're talking about the emotions that swirl around it, and those are just incredibly common. Now, with uh, light, I just had you kind of whisper, uh, this ain't that. I need this next, like, three-word thing to sink in, and it's just the expression, I'm not alone. Can I get you to just whisper that wherever you are, just... I'm not alone. I'm not alone, and you aren't alone. We scroll through the pages of our Bible. We encounter a dear couple by the name of Abraham and Sarah who navigate years of painful infertility. Soon after, we encounter a kid by the name of Joseph. He's 17 years old. His brothers sell him. And he becomes a slave down in Egypt, separated from his home, separated from the father that he loves. You talk about relational distancing. <laughs> Jacob, uh, Joseph, Joseph is a uh, slave, is slave in Egypt. Turn the pages a little farther and you run into a woman by the name of Naomi. Her family, they become refugees during a famine. And when she finally comes back home, she feels like she has nothing. Like she's been totally emptied out. And the question in this story is, how will God meet this woman who feels emptied? And how might he be pleased to fill her. A short time later, you encounter a kid by the name of David and a jealous, insane king by the name of Saul wants to kill him. And literally, you find David fleeing for his life and sleeping, sleeping in caves. And I believe through these stories of the Bible, it's like God is whispering to us, you're not alone, you're not alone, you're not alone throughout my history. My treasured kids have had to cling to me and hold me and find me and trust me when things were absolutely crazy. And for the record, God did not exempt himself from trauma. When God walks our planet in the person of Jesus... When Jesus is arrested, 
It's someone in his inner circle. A disciple by the name of Judas who leads the arrest group to Jesus and points him out to them. Even Jesus, when he walked here, experienced abandonment, betrayal, desertion, and incredible hardship. And I believe the pages of the Bible would just whisper to us again and again, you're not alone, you're not alone, you're not alone. It feels like you can be alone. We just need to be reminded that what we're experiencing in a broken world is common. It's not that unusual, and we get the opportunity and honor and responsibility to do what saints have done throughout the ages. Cling to God and hold to God and find God when it feels like everything has been tipped upside down and the bottom has dropped out. There's a, there's a third word. I just want to focus on that third word, and this was the other concept that came to me on that winter day when I was running in the snow, and it's just the word uh, temporary. It's just the word temporary. And as I was running in the snow, the word that came to me was, uh, this will pass. And so uh, the kind of the three words for light, this ain't that. <laughs> the, the three words for common, he's with you. The, 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 the three words for uh, temporary, this will pass. This will pass. Just remember that with all this stuff swirling with uh, the virus right now, I I would predict that there will come a day when schools might reopen. (laughs) We love our restaurants. I would predict that there will come a day when we are allowed to dine in each other's company again. There will come a day when we will be able to actually shake hands with someone we love. Uh, There will come a day when we will find that the toilet paper drama of 2020 was a temporary thing. The challenges come and challenges go. It is, it is a cliche, by the way. Uh, it often goes like this. Uh, Tough times don't last. Tough people do. Yeah, I know, it's a cliche. But that first part of the cliche, tough times don't last, there's, there, there's a reason why we say that. Because those really, really difficult, awful, and challenging times generally don't last. We seem to cycle through them. We seem to move through them. We seem to heal up from them. Uh, 2010, 2008, there's the collapse of the housing market leading to the financial crisis related to the collapse of that. Notice, we used the word crisis in 2008, 2010. We didn't didn't, didn't call it a uh, challenge with the housing market. It's remembered as the collapse of the housing market. The voice that you would hear in like 2010 was this, dude, did you sell your house yet? Oh, no, no, no. It's been on the market for 18 months. We've lowered the price. We've lowered the price. We've lowered the price again. Every once in a while, we'll get someone to walk through. We cannot sell this thing. Now, that's 2010. Fast forward the tape to 2018. It is not our house has been on the market for 18 months. It's our house was on the market for 18 minutes. And we got four full price offers. Now, with that, there comes a new challenge. Within a certain price range, the ability to find a house and to buy a house. I'm not saying here trust in the U.S. economy. What I'm saying here is things just have this tendency to roll in and to roll out. So many of the challenges we experience, just those words, this will pass. This will pass this will pass. If you find this week that your heart begins to move toward deep anxiety and deep fear, just remember that short statement, it will pass. This will pass. This will pass. Now, in this moment, I... I know that many of you will feel that there are some things that simply aren't going to blow over in your life. I'm thinking specifically right now of those of you who are watching who are dealing with terminal cancer. Or you sense, Jeff, uh, 
This isn't going to go away. This, this is here and it's going to stay. I think of those of you who are caring for an aging parent, late 80s, 90s, and one thing's for certain, they are never going to be 55 years old again. And this situation doesn't feel temporary to you. I think those of you who are in the service industry or restaurant industry says, Jeff, I, they're, sure, they're going to reopen restaurants. <laughs> Depending on what happens, I don't know that mine's going to open. So how, how can we talk about serious challenges, those truly life-changing challenges as, uh, what, light and momentary? That was the expression used by the Apostle Paul. He said, um, our, our, what, our light and momentary troubles. Now, there's an impulse just to look at that and go, dude, I don't know what world you were living in. Okay, let's, let's go there. Let's talk about the world that he was living in. Those words, I, I pulled those words, our light and momentary troubles. I pulled those from uh, his letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And uh, just geographically, the way this story unfolds is that Corinth is over here in southern Greece, Paul is in Corinth for like 18 months, uh, builds a Jesus community there, and, and then he finds himself in Ephesus for three years. And what happened in Ephesus was that he and his team almost got killed. There was such intensity, there was such animosity that Paul looked at his colleagues and they went, we are never gonna get out of this alive. Paul said it felt like a Death sentence. You go, well, it doesn't feel like light and momentary to me. As he opens his second letter to the Corinthians, look the way he describes it. He just says, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. We thought we were all going to get killed. And in the very next verse, he says, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God but on God who what? But on the resurrection God. On the God who raises the dead. They reached a point of conflict. They reach a point of crisis. Where they said, we can't bear up under this anymore. It's probably going to kill us. And their hearts moved and their hearts turned to the resurrection day, the day when God calls forth his children in something that we would call the resurrection of the body. Now, that, 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 that's chapter one. Go down to uh, chapter four where there's that light and momentary trouble thing and you find uh, these words where he expounds on this. He says, uh, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead, here, this is so critical, will also raise us with Jesus. I'm desperate for you to understand what Paul is talking about here. Paul's hope, Paul's trust was that there would come a day of total healing. There would come a day of total restoration, but that day would be when he was with his resurrected Lord in a resurrected body in a resurrected planet. I just have to realize that my hope shouldn't be that my vacation gets rescheduled. Not my ultimate hope. That can be a hope, but not my ultimate hope. And my, my ultimate hope is not that somehow my retirement account will get back to where it was. That's not my, it's not my ultimate hope. And, and my ultimate hope is not picture perfect health in this life. Now, when Paul was talking about the resurrection of the body, he, he was not talking here about the cartoons you see about heaven where there's the clouds and little angels with the harp things. It, what he's talking about here is a resurrected world with a physical resurrected body that would be more alive than it, would ever, than it had ever been before. And he was looking forward to that day. And what made him think about that day is that things got so desperately bad when he was 
trying to serve and build the Jesus community in Ephesus, that it pulled his heart into the next life where the scriptures tell us uh, God will wipe away all the tears from her eyes and there, there will be no sorrow and there will be no death because God will make everything new. Because here's the challenge. With what's unfolded the last couple of weeks, it's like we don't even know what's gonna be announced next week and the week after that. It's kind of like we don't know what the future holds and Paul would go, uh, yes, you do. <laughs> you just have to look out far enough. <laughs> You see, the first principles we talked about, this is light, this is common, this is temporary. That's just good information for anybody regardless of their faith background. But this light and momentary trouble thing anchored in the resurrection, this is unique for a follower of the Christ who has been forgiven of their sins and believe that Christ wants us so badly to be with him in that life that is after death. This... This is freeing. This allows us to have a focus that is sharper and a perspective that is more accurate because we can see beyond the current problem to the way this story wraps up. So let's look at those, just a couple thoughts that Paul wrote in that uh, in that verse where, that statement where he said, our light and momentary troubles. Let's just kind of build into it. I want you to see what happens here. First first line, therefore, we do not lose heart. My friends, that's huge for this week. Therefore, we refuse to lose heart. And he goes, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. Notice the contrast there. Outside, there's challenges, there's conflicts, there's disappointments. Inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. Out here, some things are falling apart. In here, Paul is thriving internally. While things are a mess externally, outwardly, we're wasting away. Inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. And then the next verse is the verse that we started with for our, here we go, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. He's saying this is heavy, but in light of the resurrection of the body and the resurrected Christ and what he has in in store for us, this, pardon my grammar, this ain't nothing (laughs) compared with what's to come. It far outweighs them all. And then now comes the part on focus where he says, so we fix our eyes not on the turmoil around us, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For uh, since what is seen is the temporary, but what is unseen is the eternal. And that fix our eyes piece. I just love that. Therefore, we focus. We focus not only on what we see, we focus on what is unseen. And God is doing such a powerful unseen work in and around and through the conflict, but it's about focus, and focus, focus is everything. As I uh, (laughs) finished that winter's cold, snowy run and entered my driveway, and just went, okay, dude, um, it's light, it's common, it's temporary. Listen, I still had to return to all the emails and all the decisions, but listen, the focus had changed, and I believe that's at least part, part of what it means to thrive, to thrive in a season of uncertainty. Uh, A couple things for you this week. Uh, Two behaviors, two practices that I think as you move into your week, whatever happens on the news, whatever news you receive from work, I believe these two practices will help you well. Two habits. Use these throughout the week. The first is just the habit of gratitude the habit of gratitude, guaranteed some things will go wrong, focus on everything going right. The Apostle Paul would write in Philippians chapter four, he'd write this, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Paul, that's easy for you to say. I feel like an inmate under house arrest. When Paul wrote that, he was an inmate (laughs) under house arrest. And he's reminded the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. So let me, let me call you and challenge you 
to a practice that we've done before together. I just think it would great, be great to re-up on this one. Uh, each and every day, take the moment to take a notebook or a journal and simply write down three specific and unique things that you are thankful to the Lord for. Create a gratitude list. My friends, complaint is an obsession with what is going wrong. Gratitude is an obsession with what is going right. And it can help form the contours of your heart to become a person of thankfulness and grace in the land between. Behavior number one, renew a commitment to chronicling gratitude each and every day. Habit number two is just what I'm calling the habit of love. Hey, by habit of life, I just mean how you feel good about people. I mean observable actions of kindness. It, this, this, this shouldn't be small on our list in moving through the next couple complex weeks. This should, be, this should be at the top of our list. It was at the top of Jesus' list. It's Tuesday, the week that Jesus will be arrested and crucified, and we find him teaching here the temple in Jerusalem. And a religious leader walked up and said, okay, take a shot at it. What's the most important command to obey? There's lots of controversy and argument about what command was number one. And Jesus looked at the guy and said, oh, that commandment number one is easy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love God with all your soul. Love him with all your mind. But then Jesus answered a question the guy didn't ask. Jesus said, while we're at it, let me mention number two. Commandment number one, love God with your whole being. Commandment number two, Jesus said was this, love your neighbor as yourself. And I have a suspicion that I love God by loving others like I love me. Just a reminder the people of Ada Bible Church, it is logistically impossible and unrealistic for everybody to look out for everybody. What we ask is that everybody be looking out for somebody. A great question marching into your week is just the question, who am I looking out for? Who am I looking out for? Who am I looking out for? This was very close to Jesus' heart. Above everything else, love God by loving others, showing tangible kindness, acts of kindness to others. What I'm trying to say with that is this, is if your bathroom looks like this, um, it's time to share. <laughs> Look for opportunities this week to love others and to serve others as Christ loves you. This, my friends, is part of what it means to, um, to thrive in the land between. The land between, that space that we most despise, can be the very space where we thrive. The space that we detest, that we find frustrating and disappointing and depressing, is the space where our God will do some of his best work in you and some of his best work through you. And so I ask that our gracious God would be with you this week, that he would guide your focus and your perspective, that he would meet your each and every need as you work to meet the needs of others. I ask that our Lord would give patience, strength, and perseverance as you thrive in this next season.